we have just seen Jesus feed the 5,000. And he did that with, what, five loaves of bread and two fish. It was late. The disciples wanted to send the crowd away. You might remember. This is just, just a refreshing of our memories here. They wanted to send the crowd away because the need outweighed the resources. I want you to think about that. That's not a new thing, is it? It's not an old thing either. Many times at the end of the month, you're going, the need is much greater than the resources. When you're married, the need sometimes is greater than the resources. When you have children, the need is greater than the resources. Sometimes you just don't know what to say or how to go about it or how to be a good dad or a good grandpa or a grandma. You, sometimes you, you, you feel like the, the need is so intense and you just can't find the right words to say or the right things that need to be done at the time. Jesus gave them a valuable lesson and this was that lesson. If they would put their limited resources in his hands, it would be enough. That seems so simple, doesn't it? I mean, that seems like a simple thing to do. But here's the thing. Usually it's because you don't have the resources, right? So you're already a little terrified. You're already a little uh, set up, if you will. To where you're going, how in the world am I going to do this? How am I going to make these ends meet? How in the world am I going to take care of these situations? So we're kind of already set there. And then when someone comes along and says, you need to give a little more of it away. We're going, are you nuts? By the giving a little bit more of it away, I mean, you have to get out of the off the throne. You have to get out. We have to get out of the way and we have to turn it all over to the Lord. How many have a problem with that sometimes? <laughs> you know, we're already in a place of need and we've got to turn control over to God. Complete control. In order for it to work, we have to completely turn it over to God. Now that's much more difficult for some than it is others. Some of us are control freaks. Some of us like to put everything in order. We like it to stay in order. By the way, if you're one of those people, don't ever have kids. <laughs> because it'll never stay in order. My poor wife, she'll clean. It's just me right now, and, and uh, my son is with, with us right now. But it, she'll, my poor wife will clean something, and five minutes later, I've got it dirty. I mean, probably not even five minutes, and I'm thinking... What a thankless job. Because at work, if you're at work and you do a job, you like to know that the job accomplished something. Well, whoever's taking care of the house, they never get to see that. Maybe, maybe for five minutes when no one's around, they clean it and no one's around. First time somebody goes to the bathroom, it's all messed up again, right? The towels are not in order anymore. Nothing's in order. Everything is messed up. So... To turn around at that time when you're already pretty much freaking out, right? And to turn around and be able to say, well, you know what? I'm not going to worry about this. I'm just, I'm just going to give it to Jesus and I'm going to back away from this. Now, if you're like the average person, probably the average Christian, you do that a hundred times. You give it to him, then all of a sudden it starts it just oozes itself back in, doesn't it? And it's horrible at night when that happens because you give it to him so you can sleep. And then all of a sudden, you, before you even realize it, you're already playing it all in your head. You're already figuring out. Some of us even play out what we're going to say to people the next day or the two days after we see him. We play it all out in our head. And we can't just cut that cord. He's telling these guys, you know, yes, we have limited resources, but let's not send them away. And that's not computing. 
That, that's not, that, the guys are not understanding that. But here's the lesson he's trying to get across to them. Remember, they're called disciples. They're being discipled. Right? God is still working in their life. But here it is. Jesus needs to be the first one that we turn to for a solution, not the last. And yet, we do it all the time. And how many times have you spent sleepless nights worrying about something and you didn't change it one bit? The next morning you woke up and it was still there. I think the enemy robs us and he takes a very unique relationship away from us pastor what do you mean that relationship where we learn to trust in God we learn to trust in him for absolutely everything guys let's face it even though many of us have been Christians for a lot of years sometimes our faith seems really small doesn't it because the only thing it takes is for our resources to become less than the need and our faith kind of goes out the window now I'm not talking about your faith believing in Jesus as the son of God and the savior of the world I'm not talking about that I'm talking about that believing that he can do this Believing that he can do all things. And we might start out strong, but then there's like that point where there's like one more brick on the load. You know, if you're carrying a wheelbarrow and you got a, a load of bricks, sometimes there's just one more and you can't move it. And sometimes life is like that. You think, man, one more, one more brick, I'm going to collapse. I can't take care of this stuff. So as we pick up where we left off, when the crowd saw the miracle... They wanted to make Jesus their king. So let's look at John 6, John 6, 14 and 15. Keep your thumb there in Matthew. We'll be coming back to that. John 6, 14 and 15. Then it says, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. They see the miracle. Remember, in the Jewish mind, the, the prophet, the Messiah was going to come, and in their mind, he was going to overthrow the Roman rule. That's not what Jesus had in mind at all, but that's what they thought that they were going to do. That was going to be their rescue, if you will. Their Savior was going to save them from the Roman rule. But the reality of it is he had so much more in mind. Not just that, but so much more. So he goes to the mountain himself. Now I want to read something to you out of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. If you'd thumb over there. This is one of the reasons why they felt that way. If you look at Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, he says, "I will raise up for them a prophet like you," speaking to Moses, "from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command them." So, they saw the miracle they put two and two together and it comes out to five. They don't realize it comes to five. You know, when you're not thinking rationally and you're not thinking biblically, you think that you're doing the correct math, but you're really not doing the correct math. You're, you're out somewhere else, but you're not on the correct, uh, you're not using the correct math and you're not on the correct path spiritually. Okay, so they put it together. They think Jesus is the prophet, spoken of in Deuteronomy. And, and you know, they're not wrong. They're not 100% wrong, but he's much more than that. He's trying to get them to know that he's Jehovah Jireh. He's, he's the provider. He's the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. He's much more than just a prophet. But isn't this typical of human behavior? This is so predictable. All you have to do is feed people, fill their bellies for free, and they will make you their king. 
Let me say that again. All you've got to do is fill people's bellies for free and they will make you king. Kind of makes you think about some of the political platforms coming up in our election. We all love free. You know, a lot of times people will say, aren't you for free this or free? I'm absolutely for free things. But the reality of it is most of the time somebody has to pay for it somewhere along the line. So, Matthew 14, verse 22. Matthew 14, verse 22, please. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to the other side of the sea, side of, the sea of Galilee, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed around by waves, tossed by waves, for the wind was contrary, blowing against them. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, that was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. Okay? Between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. Jesus went to them, walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. You can just, you can just hear that voice, right? It's a ghost. And it says, and they cried out for How many times have we been at the end of our resources and said, this is impossible. It can't be done. It's going to take a miracle for this to happen. And we cry out in fear. And once Satan gets fear, fear is an enemy of faith. It can really mess up our faith. Now, it says he went up to the mountain to pray. And I'd like to take a look at this for a moment. Jesus knew when to pray. He knew when to get off by himself, go to the Father, and rejuvenate. He knew how to do that. We don't so much. We kind of just run out. We run out until we drop, and then we try to recharge, and we try to recharge either on Sundays, most Christians just on Sundays, some Sunday and Wednesday, but it's just not enough. We find out we just run out during the week. Now, I used to work construction. And it was hard, hot, dirty work. I was up before dawn. I would come home exhausted. I would grab a shower. I would lay down and I would sleep until Becky got home. I would get up and we would eat. And then we'd try to have some time together. And we would watch TV and I would go to sleep. On the couch. Some of you got early, right? Because you just haven't had enough sleep. You just haven't had enough rest. But I can honestly say after all these years that spiritual warfare is just as exhausting as that physical work, if not more. If you're in a battle and you're really a warrior and you're really fighting this battle for your soul, now if you've given your life to Jesus, you're fighting to stand, having done all you can do, putting on all the armor of God, you're fighting to stand in that. But you're fighting for your kids. You're fighting for your marriage. You're fighting for your grandchildren. You're fighting to pay the bills. You're fighting all these other things. And, and you're, you're exhausted. It's spiritually exhausting. And Jesus had just fed 5,000 people. And he know that's just the men. It wasn't uncommon at this time to not count the women and children in the numbers. So probably 5,000 plus. But he had just fed these 5,000s and he knows he needs to be with his father. I wish I could get that. I wish I would be a little more aware of that and that I would know when I need to be refilled. Sometimes you're running on empty. Here's the thing. He knew it and he made, he made his father that priority. Guys, the older I get, the longer I'm a Christian, the more I see my need and our need to make Jesus and make time for Jesus a strong part of our life. Now, I want to set a few of you free. 
because you've probably heard from day one that you need to rise early and do all of your devotions and get everything out of the way early in the morning so your day is set for Christ. I'm not going against that. But some of you are not early people, and no matter how many times we tell you that, you're not going to do it. I know because I'm not an early person. Here's the thing. I, I know that it sets your day. But since Jesus is outside of time, do you think he's worried about when or more about if? So, if it needs to be done when you get home, then do it when you get home. If it needs to be done before you go to bed, do it before you go to bed. If it needs to be done during your lunch hour, then do it during your lunch hour. But fill your life, fill your heart with Jesus Christ. He knew when he was running on empty and he needed to give and get back from the Father. Now, we need to keep in mind we cannot give what we do not possess. We cannot give what we do not possess. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we're spiritually bankrupt, how in the world are we going to give anything to our marriage? How are we going to give anything to our spouse? How are we going to give anything to our kids? How are we going to give anything to our job? How can we give anything to anyone if we are spiritually bankrupt? We cannot give water to a thirsty world in an empty well. And yet, that's our calling, isn't it? All of our calling as Christians is to give water to a thirsty world, to tell them about Jesus Christ. If we're going to be busy about our Father's work, we need to spend time with him and let him fill us up. Now, I, am, I want to be the first to say I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. And I often say this because I know how the enemy works, and I don't want you to feel guilty. Conviction is a completely different thing than guilt. Conviction is that sweet thing that takes place from God and he, he kind of just taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I'd like to spend more time with you. Not the switch, not the sword. It's usually calm and gentle. And there's not one of us, I, I, would, I would venture to say there's probably not one of us that wishes we spent more time with Jesus. So I could get on this bandwagon and I could make everybody feel bad, but that's not my intention. My intention is to hear what Jesus is doing and saying, can I improve that? Do I, if I'm going to fight these battles, if I'm going to come out victorious, then I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I need to be filled with the Word of God. Okay, now John tells us, if you go over to John 6.16, 6, John 6.16, 6, It says, now when evening came, the disciples went down to the sea. They got into the boat, and they went over in the sea, or on the sea, towards Capernaum. It was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat and they were afraid so a little bit more information these guys have only gone a short distance I mean rowing that's a long way but it's it's really not much where they needed to go in fact uh, the other time it said kind of, they were kind of in the middle of where they needed to be so the timeline gets a little tricky here but I want to see if we can piece it together because I think this timeline is important okay we know it was getting late and it was near dusk when the disciples approached Jesus and said, let's get rid of the crowd and let them go get their own food because we don't have enough. So it was already getting late. It was near dark, if you would. Now, I would think it would take a little bit of time to be able to distribute food to 5,000 people. It's going to take a little bit of time. And then they need to go around and pick up the fragments. They didn't leave it all there. They picked it all up. So that took some time. Now, after that, the people have been sent away. The disciples have gotten into a boat heading for Capernaum. Jesus is up on the mountain praying, and dusk has turned to dark. It is now dark. The disciples find themselves fighting against a headwind. 
You ever feel like in life you're fighting against a headwind? One step forward, two back, two forward, three back. You know, you just you feel like life is that way sometimes. They're fighting against a stormy headwind, and they've only rode about three or four miles. Now, now, Matthew 14, 25 said that it was the fourth watch of the night. Now, remember what I said about the time? That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. Jesus has been up praying on the mountain. The disciples were already tired. They wanted to send everybody away, right? He goes, no, you go get in the boat and you go, you know, to Capernaum. And they're over here, you know, heave-ho, doing the thing, trying to get there. They get pushed back. They're doing it again. They get pushed back. And if it's now, it's now between five hours and eight hours. It's between five and eight hours that they have been fighting this water. Or at least from the time that he sent them home. And five to eight hours, guys. Now, I don't know about you, but probably about an hour, I'd turn back. You know, I would have probably put about an hour into it, and I would have said, forget this, just let it wash me back ashore, and then done something else. But they're out there going and going and going. And my question would be, Jesus, where are you? You knew this. You put us on the boat. You sent us out. You knew this. Where are you in the middle of these circumstances? I've done it. I'm not, a proud of, I'm not proud of it, but I've done it before. My, my uh, resources are smaller than, than what I need God to do. And there's times when you say, Lord, where, where are you? Let's be honest, guys. Have you ever as a Christian cried out to God and wonder if he's there? Let's be honest. Yes, you have. We have. Now, we know spiritually, we know theologically from the Bible, we know he's there. But you just want him to say something. You just want him to tell you, hey, it's all going to be okay. It's all right. I'm here. And there's sometimes he's a bit silent. Now, look at this. Go back to Mark. Mark chapter 6, 47. 6, 47. Mark 6, 47. Here it is again. Now, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. And he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them, now about the fourth watch of the night. He decided to come to them, walking on the sea, and he would have passed them by. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> now, I think we can safely say that Jesus was aware of what the disciples were going through all of the time. How could he be God and not know? He was aware of what they were going through all of the time. And I would probably go as far as to say this is part of their training. This is part of their continued training. You see, I'm one of these guys, I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe in accidents. I believe that if God's really in charge, he's in charge. And that things happen for a reason. So, here he is. He's training these guys. Now, I also believe, guys, and, and you have full freedom to disagree with me on this. I believe that every decision we make is a spiritual decision. I don't believe there's, no, there's any neutral decisions. I just, I just don't believe that. We've got God running the universe. You've got a child of God who's connected to Jesus Christ, and he wants to know what's going on. We know right from wrong. We know good from evil. And we make decisions that are sometimes just plain out dumb. Right? The situation smells Things don't look right. It's like these scam emails that we get. Somebody wants to give you a million dollars. Doesn't something smell wrong about that? 
Somebody wants to give you something for free. Doesn't that smell a little funny? Now, if they were a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and they wanted to do that gift, you might not doubt it so much. But when you don't know this person and they want to give you something for absolutely free, and what do we do? We click on the button. I wonder where this is going to take us. And then we got to take our computer to the geek squad to have them wipe it all out because we did something silly. Of course, none of us have done that here. I know we haven't, but now, remember the first time this went, this, this took place? Remember, there's another boat story, right? And you might remember that the first time that this took place, they were in a boat, a storm came up, and where was Jesus? He was sleeping in the back of the boat on a pillow. I don't know if you caught that, but it says in there he was on a pillow. So he was on a pillow in the back of the boat sleeping. And they were freaking out. They thought that they were going to die. You see, that's what fear does. Fear tells us you're going to die. Because the father of lies loves to whisper lies in our ears. He loves to tell us something that's not true about Jesus Christ. So we will doubt him. Instead of being able to put our full trust in him. Now, they even went as far as to say, don't you care that we might die? They've been with Jesus. They've, They've broken bread with Jesus. They've watched him do miracles. They've watched him do amazing things. And now they're 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 afraid. So this fear makes them talk to the Messiah in such a sarcastic, doubting way. Aren't you afraid that we might die? Well, I'm not afraid of it, no. I'm not afraid of it. Remember what he said to them? Look at Mark 440 and 441. He said to them, why Are you so fearful? That's my question today. Why are we so fearful? I'm not going to ask a show of hands, but if I ask for a show of hands of you that seem like you kind of live in fear of something, there'd be quite a few hands that would go up. Some of that might come from our past. Some of that might come from our our present (laughs) But some people live in that kind of fear. Instead of being able to know that they know that they know that Jesus loves them, that Jesus has forgiven them, and that all is okay, that he's still on the throne. No matter what the world looks like, no matter what's going on, he's still on the throne. Now, he added to that. He goes, why are you so fearful? But he also adds and says what? Why is it that you have no Faith. Why is it that you have no faith? I've asked myself that question sometimes, haven't you? Haven't you asked yourself, why don't I have the faith to stand in this? And I'm pretty good. I've been a Christian for quite a while, and I'm pretty good with all the normal stuff, right? But it's that last brick. It's that last brick. And by the way, every one of us has a last brick. And it's that last brick where you're going, God. Are you going to come through? Are you going to show up? Are you, going to, are you going to do this thing that I need you to do? And there in Mark 40, 41, it says, And they feared exceedingly, and they said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obeys him? So they're starting to put it together, right? They're starting to get it theologically. They're starting to know what the scripture says or what Jesus has told them. They're getting it here. They're beginning to understand it. But that 18 inches between here and the heart, sometimes that can seem like miles of being able to know that you know that you know that you know. Well, this time he steps it up. This is the second time in the boat. They've been out there in that boat for a long, long time while Jesus, Jesus knows everything. I'm sure he heard them out there yelling and screaming. 
They were fishermen. Maybe he even said a few things that we can't repeat. This wind, we can't get anywhere. How are we supposed to get anywhere? Jesus, where are you? Every foot I take him back, where are you now? So he decides to go out and see him. He's going to answer their prayer. So what does he do? He does what the Messiah does. He starts walking on water. And he walks on water, and he starts walking out in the sea to try to get to these guys. And then 26, it says, and when they saw him walking on the sea, they said, it's a ghost. Where's the faith? From feeding 5,000 and being a part of what Jesus done to, to believing in the ghost. You know, this is a ghost walking on the water. I love, and I'll say it again, I love how honest the Bible is. It portrays the human side of people. And guys, that's what we all are. We're people. And as much as we love Jesus, and as much as we want to love him more, we're just people. But that's why we need a Messiah to be there in our infirmities, to make up for our weaknesses. Now, these are disciples, right? These are disciples slash apostles slash men of God. Chosen by Jesus. If I was Jesus, I'd begin to wonder about my choice. But he's chosen them. These are men who are going to change the world. I want you to think about that. These are 12 men that are going to change the world. And what's the first thing that comes out of their mouth? It's a ghost. Now, I don't know about you guys, but in a weird sense, that brings me comfort. Because they were just people. They were just folks growing in their relationship with God like all the rest of us. They're terrified and they cry out in fear. But I want you to look at Jesus' response. He doesn't go, you guys are dumb. You guys, you guys, I, you know what? I'm starting all over again. The only problem is I can't find anybody smarter than any of you guys, so I'm stuck. He doesn't do that. Look at what he says. In Matthew 14, 27, he says, and Jesus immediately spoke to them. He didn't let them rot in their fear. He didn't let them simmer in the fear any longer than needed to. And he immediately spoke to them. And what does he say? Be of good cheer. What is that? What would that, how would that translate today? Be happy. Don't be afraid. Get your joy on. You know? Rethink Rethink where your headspace is at. You got it back in superstition. You got it back into the old things that everybody's told you about the ocean and the mermaids and all the, all the other garbage. You, you, you quickly went back and the enemy has got you right where he wants you in that fear. But he comes and says, guys, you don't need to worry about that. Be of good cheer. It is I. And I find it interesting that he didn't say, it is I, the Savior of the world, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know, they're freaking out. He makes it short. He says, it is I. You know what he's saying? Guys, I've been with you. You know who I am. You've watched me work. So when he said, it is I, he's, he's putting all of that in there. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the Savior. He's putting all of that in there, but he doesn't have to say it. He reminds them, guys, who are you looking at? Who is with you right now? Do not be afraid. Oh, that we could get that. At 2 o'clock in the morning when we're sweating everything and worrying about everything. All that we could get that. All that we could hear that voice and say, it is I. 
don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. As I said, his response was immediate. He doesn't let them stay in that fear. He reassures them, tells them not to be afraid. Now, I think from Peter's response, we begin to see growth. We begin to see growth in the disciples. That growth is not yet matured, but it's growing. He's growing in his faith. Look at Matthew 14, 28. Matthew 14, 28, and Peter answered him. Peter's Peter. You know, they often accuse Peter of foot and mouth disease because he might often put his foot in his mouth. But one thing you got to say about Peter, he was, willing, he was willing to do what other people wouldn't do. He was a go-getter. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, then command me to you on the water. I want to walk on water like you are. Lord, command me to come out, and I'll come out. And Jesus said, come. Come on. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. Let me ask you an honest question. How many of us would have had the faith to get out of that boat and put your feet on the water? Honestly, probably not too many of us. You know why? Our headspace would have went back to all the things that seem logical. Our headspace would have went to the impossible, not to Jesus. It would have gone to the impossibility of this, not to the one asking us to walk. It would have gone to all the doubts, and it would have gone to all of the fears. Peter's pumped. He sees you walking, I want to do it, Lord, so he gets out there. Look at verse 30. And when he saw that the wind was boisterous, it just means it was a whirlwind. It was a lot going on. It was a storm. And when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was what? He was afraid. And beginning to sink, <laughs> he cried out, Lord, save me. I'll say it again. Fear is an enemy of faith. Peter was fine until his focus became the storm. Peter's a lot like us. I don't know if I would have made it as far as Peter. I would have been telling Pastor Dan to get out of the boat. You do it. You do it. You got more faith than me. You go ahead. Get, 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 a, get out there on the water. Well, I'd have been waiting for John or somebody else. I would have been waiting for one of the disciples to go out and give it a shot. I probably, I prob probably couldn't even have gotten enough courage to get out and get on the water, to be honest with you. My brain would have been going, this is not possible. This is all, this is against logic. This is, you know, physics. This, this, this can't happen. But it's interesting that as long as he had his focus on Jesus, he was walking on water. As long as he believed that God could hold him up in the middle of the storm, he was fine. But the minute he began to hear the rustling and the noise, he began to sink. Now, I think there's even grace in that. I would have probably just gone... In the water. I wouldn't have slowly gotten down. There wouldn't have been no hand for him to grab. I would have just sunk, you know. But I think even in this, there's grace because he's going down slow enough, Jesus can reach down and grabs his hand, pulls him up. Look at Jesus' response this time. In this storm, in this boat, he said he immediately reached down Grabbed his hand. Says he caught him in Matthew 14. But look what he says. I want you to notice what he says. It's different than the first time. What does he say this time? Oh, you of little faith. What did he say the first time? No faith. No faith. 
But now he says, O ye of little faith. But it's the same question. Why did you doubt? Guys, being a Christian is growing a little bit. God will take us through situations. He'll take us through trials in order that faith might grow in us so that we're able to stand without doubt and be able to stand without fear. When they saw the miracles, they were sure, truly you are the Son of God. But when they saw the storm, got the best of them. But the disciples are growing. I would like to say this. As Christians, we should be growing. Don't compare it to anyone else. Don't measure it horizontally by somebody else that you think is far ahead of you. Because in their darkest hour, they might have some of the same fears. But I also believe that that's why God puts us together as a family. I also believe that that's why God puts us together in fellowship. Because we need each other's encouragement. Have you found, at least in my marriage, when, when Becky has a heart for something, I might not. And when I have a heart for something, she might not. But it's what keeps us balanced. It's what, it's what keeps us in the game. It keeps us uh, doing the things that God would want us to do. Fellowship, hanging out with other Christians is the same way. You may come in really down. Your resources are not there. The need's great. And somebody can pray with you and say, remember how much the Lord loves you. And it might be just enough for you to get back in the game. It might be just enough for you to walk on water. It might be just enough for you to hold out till you begin to see the miracle of what God's got planned in our life. Guys, we need each other. We really do. We need that fellowship. Because I'll tell you this, it is a tactic of the enemy to separate us from our Father. It is his desire to lie, cheat, steal, kill, maim, and mutilate and destroy the image of Jesus in the life of Jesus' kids. That's what we know he's going to do. That's, we know that we, if we give him an inch, he'll take a mile. We know that that's what he wants to do. And a sheep was most vulnerable when they got off by themselves. The great shepherd tries to get them together because there's safety in the numbers. And that's why we need that fellowship. But I want, to, I want to stop with this. I want to end with this. They're growing. Are you growing in the Lord? It doesn't have to be tons. People will say, well, you know, you're a godly man. No, I'm not. I'm a sinner just like you guys are. What, is, what does it mean to be a godly man? I, I, I need salvation like everybody else. I need prayer like everybody else. I have faults like everybody else. Just ask my wife and my kids. They'll tell you. But what does it mean to be a godly man? I'm a, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And hopefully I'm growing. Hopefully I'm growing so that the next trial that comes my way, I can stand. I've been through a lot of trials, and now sometimes I can stand with someone who, does, who has little faith. I can stand with him because I can honestly tell him God's there for you. God will be there for you. It may not be exactly the way you want. It may not even turn out exactly the way you want, but I can promise you that God will not leave you nor forsake you. I can promise you that. I know that that's true. But you know what? In my next trial, I, need, I might need you to tell me that. I might need you to remind me of how good our God really is. Guys, that's what faith is all about. It's getting to know Jesus. That's it. Faith is getting to know Jesus because the more we know about Jesus, the less we fear. These guys were doubting because they didn't really know Jesus yet. They wanted to know him. They were growing, but they didn't know him yet. They didn't know that whether he was there or whether he was in heaven, he still had the same power. 
They didn't know if he was at the bottom of the boat asleep. He still had the same power as if he was awake. They didn't understand that if he was up on the mountain, they could still speak to him. 